If an evil tree turned your son into a vampire, forcing him to consume greater and greater quantities of blood in order to survive, what would you do? At first, it's just a pint here and there to tie him over. But before long, Owen's appetite for blood becomes insatiable. And with all these nice, juicy family members around, it's only a matter of time before he does something terrible. Oh, and of course his mom thinks she can cure him on her own. All she needs is time and a few generous donations from the community. I'm going to break down the mistakes made what you should do and how to beat the vampires in blood. Jess is trying to turn things around. A messy divorce has uprooted her small family from their cozy suburban home and forced them out to their late aunt's farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Naturally, young Tyler and her little brother, Owen, aren't super stoked about this, but everyone's willing to give the place a chance in light of the circumstance. Everyone except the family dog. That is, evidently, something about this change of scenery really rubs Pip in the wrong way. So much so, not even a day goes by before he completely disappears. Oh, but don't worry though, he'll be coming right back. What's wrong with him? Step back to me, Owen. Slowly. Aw, he's happy to see you. Yeah, this isn't good. Pip's giving off serious old yeller vibes right now. The good news is that symptomatic rabies is totally preventable with modern medicine. A lacerated jugular, on the other hand, not so much. That's what happens when you try controlling the person being attacked and not the animal doing the attacking. Even without the bite to the throat, pulling on Owen like a game of human tug of war is only gonna make the wound on his ankle that much worse. Instead, we should have focused our efforts on Pippin directly and dogpiled him the second he latched onto Owen's leg. Going for kicks to the side of her head will probably get him to let go, but that'll most likely result in us getting chopped on as well. And he'd still be free to go after Owen a second time once he recovered. A better option would be straddling the dog with all our weight on his back and strangling him to death from behind. We'll want to place the bony part of our forearm against his windpipe and squeeze with everything we've got until he goes limp. And even then, I'd probably keep it up for at least a couple more minutes to make sure he's gone for good. It also couldn't hurt to have Tyler run inside and grab a kitchen knife or something we could use to jam through his ribs. They're gonna have to kill him to conduct the rabies test regardless, so there's no point in holding back, especially with Owen bleeding all over the lawn. Lucky for him, Jess is a nurse, because of course she is, and apparently she's also strong enough to crush a dog's skull with nothing but a plastic water dish. I mean, if it works, it works but she's betting a whole lot on the DPS of a cheap piece of garbage. Regardless, they're able to get Owen to the hospital in time to save his life, and before long, he's even stable enough to start eating again, or so they think. Code blue! Code blue! I'll be right back. Hospital food, am I right? I'm not a doctor. Actually, I'm pretty much the opposite of one. But this doesn't seem like something you'd normally see after a dog bite, even one as severe as what Owen experienced. All the foaming of the mouth brings rabies to mind, but it's far too soon for symptoms to manifest, especially ones that intense. Besides, all the associated tests are apparently coming back negative. According to the medical staff, the boy's sudden deterioration is the result of anemia, which they believe is the result of a viral or bacterial infection transmitted to him from the dog. It's far too early at this point to conclude there's evil afoot, but we should be sure to mention the circumstances surrounding Pippin's disappearance so they're aware of the possibility that it might be something he contracted in the wild. It'd also be worth consulting with a local biologist in case there are any known pathogens circulating among animal populations in the area that could potentially spread to humans. For all we know, he's contracted the canine equivalent of a chronic wasting disease. Although, if that's the case, I'd imagine the treatment likely involves staring up at a Makarov pistol after digging a big hole. One thing's for sure, we need to coordinate with our ex and other family members to ensure round-the-clock surveillance of Owen's status, in addition to what the hospital's already providing. Fact is, they don't actually know what's wrong with him. The whole anemia thing is certainly possible, but at this point, it's only speculation, so any changes in his condition, however insignificant, should be reported to the doctors immediately. Immediately. And that goes double for his newly acquired thirst for human blood. Owen, what are you? Owen, what are you doing? Give me that. 
Don't worry, I'm sure this is totally just a one-time thing. Clearly, Jess agrees, as she completely neglects to tell the responding physician what she just witnessed, even after the doctor remarks on how his condition suddenly improved. Hmm, it's almost as if those two things are related. What possible reason could you have to not mention this? It's not like the doctor's gonna immediately try and jam a stake through his heart. <laughs> If anything, she'll probably just write it off as bizarre behavior brought on by his fever. But we need to establish a precedent in case he needs to re-up. And you know that's gonna be a thing. I mean, just look at him. He's staring at the blood like it's a bag full of Robux. And sure enough, the next day when Jess has the cafeteria whip up his favorite meal, Owen wants nothing to do with it. Hey, so, what do you want? Anything at all? <laughs> Hey, you said anything he wanted. Of course, Jess denies Owen's bloodlust outright, claiming he was just confused. That is, until later that day when his vitals start plummeting once again. Putting two and two together, she uses her hospital credentials to gain access to the blood. Cooler thing to check out another dose of Oneg under the guise of it being damaged. You know, just the most valuable blood type on the planet Earth that they're constantly trying to get more of. Why not start with a unit of AB positive and see if that sets him straight. You're not even transfusing it, so what does it matter? I only bring this up because, of course, they're gonna notice the loss of something so valuable. And if he's gonna need blood on a daily basis to keep from relapsing, we may have to keep this up for quite some time while we work out a more permanent solution. Of course, that wouldn't be necessary if we could prove to Owen's doctor that this unconventional treatment plan is actually working, which is gonna be a lot harder to do after concealing his first course. I mean, think about it. Had we spoken up before, they would at very least understand how we could make the leap in logic to connect the incident with this sudden improvement, even if they don't actually believe it themselves. Now, if they catch us feeding him a blood pack for seemingly no reason, they're gonna think we've completely lost our mind. Owen, oh, let's not forget that by hiding his latest drop in vitals from the hospital staff, they're just going to assume he got better on his own, meaning they're going to stop looking into what caused it his illness in the first place and call this one good. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. And because Jess is a nurse with experience in long-term care, Owen's doctor feels comfortable releasing him earlier than she otherwise would. Awesome. Well, nothing left to do now but load up on a full four days worth of blood bags and head back home. Surely this entire ordeal won't last any longer than that. What if we run out? We won't. Okay, it's temporary, right? It's gonna stop. Yes, because they totally covered this novel affliction of unknown origin during her nursing program. Time to face facts. We are completely in over our heads here. Nothing like this has ever been documented by medical science, and googling therapeutic blood drinking won't turn up more than a few dozen schizoid Tumblr pages. We have one, and only one chance of keeping this up long term, and that's finding Owen an alternative food source, which is gonna have to happen sooner rather than later, because young Dracula winds up guzzling down their entire supply in one sitting. Oh, and to make matters worse, the hospital noticed all the quote-unquote damaged blood bags disappearing and started restricting entry to the storage room. Who could have seen that coming? The obvious answer here is to substitute with animal blood, which to her credit, Jess thinks to try after losing access to the mother load. And what better place to start than the local pet store? Sorry, Thumper. No new home and loving family for you. You have to die so that Jess here can avoid seeking help for her son's rapidly escalating vampirism. Of course, if this actually works, we'll have to find something other than pet rabbits to quench his thirst. I mean, that's like a hundred bucks a pop. And with Owen slurping down about a pint a day at this point, you'll need two or three every time just to keep him from spazzing out. Nine grand a month might work for the liver king, but for a single mom on a nurse's salary, forget it. Besides, bunnies are free. You just have to set up a few snares. Then again, wild animals carry all sorts of cooties in their veins that could potentially transfer upon ingestion. In that case, livestock would probably be a slightly better option. I'd try contacting a local butcher shop to see 
see if they'd be willing to special order some in large quantities from their abattoir. Bonus points if we can find a halal or kosher shop that slaughters on site. Both religions require the animal to be completely drained of blood before consumption, and it'd probably just be running down the drain anyway, so they might be willing to let us have it for free. Unfortunately, none of this actually matters, because Owen's hyper-discerning palate spots the difference right away, with some rather unpleasant results. Owen? Well, that's just great. Nothing to do now but give him the old Kate Beckinsale. How could that possibly get out of hand? All right, I'd get seeing your son seizing up like that would be pretty traumatic, and you'd probably want to do just about anything to keep that from happening again. But given that involves acquiring an inexhaustible supply of human blood, maybe we should try again with something a little closer to the real deal, like pig's blood, for example. Nine out of 10 cannibals agree, we taste just like like them. And for years, insulin from pigs was used in treating humans with diabetes. There's even cases of humans receiving organ transplants from pigs, albeit genetically modified ones. At the very least, we could try cutting our own blood with it, so we don't bleed ourselves dry in a matter of days. Sure, if all he needs is plasma, we could regenerate that in about 24 hours. But the problem is we have no way of separating that from the whole blood here at home. And since it can take days or even weeks to replenish your red blood cells following a single unit donation. It'll only take a few feeding sessions before we're too anemic to even hold the needle. At this point, I think our only viable option is focusing 100% of our efforts convincing a few doctors that this is a thing. And that's definitely easier said than done. Luckily, Jess has a close friend on the nursing staff we could potentially use as a stepping stone to build up our credibility. I'd start by explaining the situation to Tyler, as she's most likely to believe us. And could even help ease the burden of donating blood if she's willing to do so. A simple before and after test showing how dramatically he improves after imbibing should do the trick. Now for the hard part. We call up Jess's friend Candace to ask if she can help us with Owen real quick. And once she arrives, we do something drastic. No, I don't mean we kill her and drain her blood, you psychos. Not yet, anyway. Instead, we should secretly feed Owen some of the rabbit blood to make him start seizing up while she's in the room. At which point, we'll administer the human blood right in front of her, so she can observe how quickly it helps him recover. We'll also want to make sure the whole episode is caught on camera so we can show the doctors, because there's no way they'll let us demonstrate something like this in the hospital. Jess has a pretty good relationship with all the doctors at her work, and between her and Candace's testimony and the video evidence, there's a good chance they'll take it seriously. From there, it's a matter of relaying the evidence through the medical community at large until we can have them evaluated by a major medical institution. Of course, this will almost certainly require him to spend a great deal of time away from home, surrounded by strangers wearing full hazmat gear. And there's definitely no guarantee they'll be able to cure him, but he'll have a better chance than he would back at home. Besides, what exactly is the alternative here? We can't keep him hidden away forever, and at some point, Jess is going to have to go to work. Meanwhile, Owen's appetite is clearly insatiable, as we saw with him raiding their private reserve. He'll consume as much as he can get his hands on. So are we really going to let him stay at home by himself with his sister? You know, the one full of blood. Oh, and then there's the fact that Jess's ex, Patrick, gets custody every other weekend. I'm sure that'll go great. What happens when he runs out of goat juice mid-visit and starts convulsing again? Not to mention the fact that he can't eat or drink literally anything else. His dad would have to be completely brain dead not to notice something's up. And if he finds that bottle of blood Jess sent him with, well, at least the custody battle will be over. I'd say this is another reason we should get Tyler on board. But honestly, once you reach the point of needing your daughter to cover up her brother's thirst for human blood, things have gotten entirely out of hand. But just when it all seems totally hopeless, the universe throws Jess a bone in the form of a longtime patient by the name of Helen Osgood. It seems after learning about her terminal thyroid cancer, Helen decided to do something YouTube won't let me talk about. Only things didn't go as planned. She sang. I mean, no, I wanna die. She 
wants to die. That's pretty clear. Yeah, cool. So anyway, has anyone called it dibs on your blood yet? Or what's up with that? Unfortunately for Helen, she survives. And I say that's because what she winds up going through here in a bit is far worse than death. For now, she's been sedated and restrained in one of the hospital rooms, making the old lady easy prey for the woman Skeeto on her never-ending quest for human blood. Problem is, there's all these pesky doctors around trying to examine their patients and whatnot. They're really making it difficult for us to steal people's bodily fluids. Of course, the other problem is that, best case scenario, you're able to make off with, what, a single day supply? Is that really worth losing your job or even winding up behind bars? Sure, at this point, Jess has got to be loopier than a bowl of Cheerios from all the donations, so she's probably not thinking too far ahead. But even if Owen goes long enough without beating to start wigging out again, the hospital was able to bring him back once already with conventional medicine. As a matter of fact, she doesn't actually know he'll die from prolonged bloodlessness. Pe Continuing to feed his addiction could very well be making it worse in the long run. But does any of that cross Jess's mind? Absolutely not. Only thing she can think about right now is all that delicious blood sloshing around inside Mrs. Osgood's delicate veins. All while her self-induced super anemia nearly causes her to burn the entire house down. <laughs> Nice one. At least she was coherent enough to not throw water on it. Sadly, this moment only serves to intensify Jess's desire to find another blood source. Only this time, she's not just looking for a single unit. She wants the whole factory. And wouldn't you know it, sweet old Helen is finally ready to check out. There she is now, sitting at the bus stop with a whole new lease on life. She's probably thinking something like, boy, I sure hope no one imprisons me in an unfinished basement so they can siphon off my vital essence like an awful human blood cow thing. Little does she realize, Jess is just delirious enough to actually try something so ridiculously myopic. You hear that? You hear what? Let's be one of the kids' soccer balls. I'm gonna pull over. Yes, just a soccer ball, and totally not the tire iron she's about to bludgeon you with. Nah, I'm just kidding. It's actually a medical bag filled with syringes and a vial of go-to-sleep juice. Pretty much everything she needs to put her half-baked plan into action. Once again, it takes a while to fully replenish the red blood cells lost after giving up a single pint. Other components like plasma come back a lot faster and will dilute the rest of your blood supply. So if Helen had eight pints to start with and just took one a day, she'd still have more than half her red blood cells left after four days. Not much more though. All things considered, this is an extremely temporary solution. We're talking a matter of days before Helen's totally done. Besides, now you have to keep your human livestock well nourished and hydrated behind your daughter's back. And what if she has to use the bathroom? You're a monster. Yeah, I gotta agree with her on that, especially considering the amount of blood she'll ultimately receive from her casual crime against humanity is only slightly more than she'd get by putting Helen out of her misery now. All in all, she's looking at about a week and a half's worth from this endeavor, and that includes what she gets from draining Helen dry after she expires. Is that worth spending the rest of your life in prison and turning your little vampire Helian loose on society? Doesn't seem like it to me. And make no mistake about this, Jess is 100% getting caught. Helen will have been last seen entering her vehicle, which will make her person of interest number one once the missing person report goes out. From there, she's just one Jim Can't Swim interrogation video away from landing herself in a jail cell while investigators tear her house apart. Meanwhile, Tyler and Owen will be sent to their dad's house where Tiny Vladimir's insatiable bloodthirst will continue to grow until he annihilates the entire family and drinks them all dry. By the way, all this V8 juice isn't making him any better. Sure, it's keeping him on his feet, but in terms of getting him back to normal, he's way worse. I mean, just look at this. I can't sleep. Are you hungry? Mom? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Mm, you hear that? He likes it when it's warm, as in fresh off the tap. 
Oh, and just look at that freakish yellow glow over his left eye. Remind you of anyone? At least with Pippin, there's a known biological reason why his eyes were shining in the dark. And humans, on the other hand, we call this a mutation. Just another reason atop the long list of reasons why we need to swallow our pride and get him in front of as many doctors as we possibly can. Yes, at first, they're going to write it off as some kind of Munchausen by proxy. And in all likelihood, CPS will get involved. Jess will probably lose custody, at least temporarily, of both Tyler and Owen in the process. But the fact remains that right now, he has no known infections of any kind, and the only thing his body will respond to positively is human blood. With no other options, at some point the doctors will either give in and try Jess's jacked up home remedy, or simply let him die. And given he's very obviously turning into a vampire right now, the latter doesn't sound all that bad to me. Oh, but nerd, you say. Vampirism isn't a thing. Surely no no one in their right mind would ever consider the possibility that their son is turning into one. Well, let's break it down. He can't sleep at night. He's spontaneously developing some kind of night vision. He can only metabolize human blood. And he's dressing up in black leather clothing and shooting up werewolves. Okay, I made up that last one. But what else would you call him right now? This is the blood-sucking equivalent of it can't be zombies. And getting back to Helen for a second. How exactly are you going to hide this from Tyler? You were already sequestering yourself upstairs to feed Owen throughout the day. Now you have to do the same for her. Oh, and suddenly there's this padlock on the basement door for some reason. Nothing to read into there, except you forgot to lock the basement window. What is this, your family's first kidnapping? You left Helen with a perfectly viable means of escape if she managed to slip her restraints. Plus, now Tyler can get in and tragically misread the situation. Wait, no. I think she actually has a pretty solid grasp of what's going on here. When did that gag come off? Tyler? Honey? Whatever you think, it's it's not what it looks like. Oh, so you're not imprisoning a senior citizen while slowly bleeding her to death? Okay, my mistake. Probably should have let Tyler in on Owen's little secret the moment we put it together. Finding out your little brother's a daywalker and your mother's playing Renfield and all in one sitting must take quite a toll. The good news is that now she can help keep a lid on things during weekends with her father. And given Owen's current mental state, her help is pretty much essential at this point. Of course, and realizing that, it should be apparent that her mom has completely lost control of the situation. Jess insists that this unorthodox treatment of hers is helping him. Question is, helping him what? He can't possibly live a normal life like this. She can't send him to school knowing the smallest drop of blood will throw him into goblin mode, and homeschooling's out of the question as long as she's working a full-time job. Besides, even if she could somehow raise him to adulthood, what then? She can't keep him locked away forever. All this is to say, if Tyler really wants to help her brother, she needs to tell her dad what's going on. He's obviously not going to believe Owen's condition is legit, but the end result will ultimately be him winding up in the hospital where people far more qualified than Jess can have a chance to noodle over his condition. I mean, it's not like she's rubbing him down with crystals or whatever, but undiscovered mutagenic viruses fall just outside of Jess's area of expertise. And apparently, so does wrongful imprisonment, as she falls hook, line, and sinker for Helen's phony Stockholm Syndrome. I help you. I'll stay. Really? The arm? This psycho's kept you locked up here for days, literally bleeding you dry, and you stab her in the one place that is virtually guaranteed to do nothing. After everything you've been through, this 100% constitutes an eye and throat type situation, with about 26 repetitions for good measure. If not for yourself, then do it for all the other people she'll be kidnapping after exhausting your rapidly dwindling blood supply. But because Helen's simply unwilling to commit to violence, Jess is easily able to regain control over the situation, and just in time for a surprise visit from the boys in blue. Turns out, Jess's friend Candace narked on her for showing an unusual interest in Mrs. Osgood, and now that she's been reported missing, that seems a little bit suspicious. Oh, yeah, there's also this. Man, we have security camera footage from the hospital parking lot showing Miss Osgood getting into your car. Gee, thanks, Barney. A gotcha moment like that is something you save for the interview room down at the station after she's already made 
made conflicting statements. Instead, you gave it to her right off the bat so she can play it off like it's nothing, which it totally would be if the missing person weren't currently screaming for help down in Jess's basement. Unfortunately, Helen's cries just aren't quite loud enough to get the officer's attention, and despite being dumb enough to leave a deadly weapon within arm's reach of her prisoner, Jess manages to skate through the confrontation without saying anything incriminating. It's not over yet for the old blood bag. At least, not yet. Evidently, that cot Jess strapped to her was rated for hostage situations, giving Helen one last chance to make her escape while Jess is off picking up Tyler and Owen from their dad's place. Now, all that separates her from the outside world is a cheaply made padlock crudely fastened to a flimsy wooden door. I mean, you'd think after her previous escape attempt, Jess would have beefed up security a little bit, especially now that she doesn't have to worry about hiding it from her daughter. At the very least, she could have wedged a chair against the door or something. I can't fault Helen for wanting to get out as quickly as possible, but she should have slowed her roll a bit and tried escaping through the basement window instead. It wouldn't be easy given her advanced age and compromised state, but there's plenty of junk lying around the basement she could pile up to give herself a boost. This way, it wouldn't be readily apparent to her captors that she's escaped, lending her a bit more of a head start before Team Edward could start their pursuit. Of course, it also doesn't help that they happened to get home, like, right as she was making her exit. That said, it's still no reason to go running aimlessly through the trees in near total darkness. Last thing we need is a sprained ankle slowing us down this close to freedom, or worse. <laughs> Damn, that's gotta be like one in a million. Needless to say, barbed wire wasn't designed to kill, but neither were crowbars, and they work just fine. She never could have predicted something like that would happen, but moving that quickly was a bad idea in the first place. Remember, they have no idea how long she'd been gone, much less in what direction she might have left, so we could have afforded to slow it down a bit and keep an eye out for hazards or anything that might give away our position. After all, tearing through the brush like that would make make a ton of noise, which on a quiet night in the middle of nowhere can carry quite some distance. Besides, in her state, it probably wasn't a good idea to get the juices flowing. Speaking of which, Owen is on it like the last slice of pizza, and he's not stopping until the well runs dry. Well, that's just great. The little glutton's gonna suck down another stockpile. Plus, now he's pulling this crap. Owen! Yeah, that's normal. Oh, but he's totally not a vampire. Right, guys? That would be crazy. Well, whatever he is, he's still the size of a frickin' Cabbage Patch doll. We should've just hit him with the hose and bottled the rest of Helen's cherry aid before she totally bleeds out. Now, we're back to bloodletting until we find him another food source. And if things weren't bad enough, Big Brother's finally taken notice of the fact that Owen hasn't been to school for weeks. As a result, CPS is called in to haul Tyler and Owen off to their dads. You know, the guy who has absolutely no idea what's been going on this whole time. Fortunately, Tyler will still be around to try to keep her little bro from going all 30 days of night on the ass. Although at this point, I'm not sure that's enough. As for blood, all Jess can muster is a partial bottle full. I guess we'll just have to make it last. Oh, she's a great person. She well, that's not good. I'm sorry, whose idea was it to leave the blood bottle with Count Bratula? Tyler should have had that thing straight up glued to her hand at all times. Oh, well, it's not like such a small amount was gonna keep him satiated for longer than 11 minutes anyways. We need to come up with a permanent solution fast before Owen's uncontrollable cravings force him to do something terrible. And I don't mean robbing a blood bank. Far gone as he may be, there might still be time to come clean about the situation and have him hospitalized. All we'd have to do is bring the empty water bottle to Patrick and let him take a whiff of the inside. Then, at the very least, he'll want to have Owen checked out for having drank so much human blood. Apart from that, we need to start thinking about self-defense. This whole mess started after he was bitten by their dog, which Tyler witnessed firsthand. And right now, her brother's got the same look in his eyes that Pippin did right before the end. Sure, we don't exactly know whether Owen will start showing the same kind of aggression, but it couldn't hurt to be prepared just in case. The good news 
is, Tyler's got a pretty decent size advantage on him. And considering it only took a few bonks to do the doggo in, it's not like we're gonna need Van Helsing's full auto crossbow to get the job done. A quick trip out to the garage ought to suffice. I'm thinking something along the lines of a framing hammer. But just about any concealable blunt object will work in a pinch. Horrible as it may seem to have to bludgeon your little brother to death, we'd probably be doing him a favor. And at this point, it may not just be our life we're protecting. <laughs> Jesus, dude. Her? At least pick something that'll fill you up. I'd say this is as good a sign as any that Owen's beyond rehabilitation, but Tyler's not ready to give up on him just yet. Although I'm not sure her plan's gonna go as well as she hopes. You see, just before they left for their dads, Tyler remembered this menacing dead tree out near their house. Back when they first moved in, Pippin seemed afraid of the tree, and yet also drawn to it, causing him to nearly drown in the deep mud surrounding the trunk. According to Tyler, either the tree or something in it must have gotten inside Pippin's head, and whatever it is, was passed over to Owen after the attack. The way she sees it, burning the tree down could potentially lift the hypothetical curse, thereby sparing her brother from a life of wearing capes and sleeping in coffins, without having to take him out in the process. There's just one problem with her line of thinking here. Actually, there's three. First of all, the tree is, in fact, very creepy. But aside from that, there's no proof it's anything other than an ugly standing dead. Second, while Pippin did freak out at the sight of the tree, well, Pippin was a dog. Sometimes dogs just freak out about inanimate objects for literally no reason. That doesn't mean they'll turn you into a monster. And finally, she has no idea whether Pippin was even around the tree when he ran away. For all Tyler knows, he got that way from sniffing an evil fire hydrant or something. Sure, considering everything we've seen so far, it's hardly beyond the realm of possibilities, but I wouldn't stake my life on it. And given she plans to ride it double on her bicycle with a literal vampire to get there, that's basically what she'd be doing. On the other hand, keeping Owen away from potential victims he could spread the infection to is definitely a priority. So getting out of the house and away from their unsuspecting family members isn't the worst idea. That said, he'll definitely be riding on the handlebars the whole trip out there. And if I hear so much as a single hiss along the way, I'm bringing the hammer down. Another issue with Tyler's plan is that she doesn't even think to drop by her mom's house despite being on her property. I mean, you'd think she wouldn't want to be alone with little bro after what she just witnessed. Dude, just tried to eat a baby, for Christ's sake. At least make him walk in front of you. Owen. Yep, I know that look. That's the whole I've succumbed to the evil within stare. Should have brought a weapon. Still, this isn't exactly Blade she's up against here. Even empty handed, Tyler could probably overpower him. Or at least shove him back long enough to grab a rock or branch and finish the job. Instead, she opts to run away, which only increases the likelihood of her tripping and falling when the plot needs it to. Plus, it also gives Owen the chance to tackle her. And even as small as he is, if he can throw his weight into her, it'll definitely definitely bring her down, which is exactly what ends up happening. Lucky for Tyler, she told her mom about the tree right before getting CPS'd, and once Patrick came by to accuse her of effectively kidnapping them, Jess realizes exactly where they must have gone. The only question now is whether she has the clarity to see what her son has become, and if so, can she do what must be done to finally end this nightmare once and for all? Difficult as it may be, the answer to both these questions is yes. <laughs> Brutal. Just think, this all could have likely been avoided had you taken him back to the f hospital. And with that, Owen's bloodthirst is finally cured. Well, pretty much. As for Jess, the medical examiner must have been out partying all week because they ruled his death a freak accident despite all the bruising that likely would have formed during the final struggle. Ultimately, she lost all custody of Tyler to her ex, which, when you think about it, is getting off pretty light considering she brutally tortured an old woman before indirectly causing her death. Ultimately, had Jess realized she was in over her head the moment Owen started feeding on human blood and reported what she saw to the doctors, there's a chance they might have been able to find him the help he needed to remain alive without preying on others. Or, at the very least, learned something from his condition to the benefit of all mankind. For that reason, I think the movie was beaten. Moral of the story, blood is thicker than water, and apparently best served warm.